Mr. Sheyo, Chief Executive Officer of IDS Malaysia, Your Excellencies, Distinguished Speakers, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen, very good morning and selamat pagi. Welcome to the launch of Malaysia's Open Budget Index, my OB and Pantau project. I'm Sri Murniati, IDS Deputy Research Director, and I will be your MC and moderator for today's event. My OB and Patau project are IDS initiative to improve transparency and accountability at the state level. We will hear from IDS research team today, the result of the transparency assessment that IDS and our partners have done in the past eight months. I hope you are excited as I am to see which states and infrastructure project perform well and not so well in terms of their disclosures and what areas of improvement can be taken. The presentations of the result will be followed by a panel discussion with two speakers here, Mr. Sheyo and also YB Datuk Muhammad Imran Tamrin, Adun for Sungai Panjang Selangor. Uh, YB Datuk uh, Sri Wilfred Tanga, which is MP for Tuaran, who has agreed to speak with us today, unfortunately can't join the discussion. He had to fly back to Sabah this morning, but I hope we will have an a insightful discussion this morning with the panel, panel and also the speakers. So the panels will respond to the result and provide insights into the way budget and infrastructure project, both in the federal and state government are governed and funded. We will also touch on the relationship between federal and state governments in our federal system and how fiscal decentralization works in it. Please allow me to begin with a short housekeeping. Uh, at IDEAS, we are committed to provide a safe environment for all parties, both internal and external to work together. IDEAS has a policy of zero tolerance towards sexual, sexual exploitations and abuse. Everyone here today is responsible for making this event a safe space for public discourse. Please be reminded that today's event is recorded and please mute your microphone during today's proceeding. During the Q&A session, you can submit your questions in the Q&A feature in Zoom. And today's event is also streamed in our social media platform. For those who join us from there, from Facebook, Thank you, and please join us in the discussion later by putting your questions in the comments. To begin today's proceeding, may I have the pleasures of inviting Trisha Yo, IDEA CEO, to deliver her welcoming remark. Please, Trisha. A very good morning. Uh, thank you to our Deputy Research Director, Sri Murniati Yusuf. Um, salam sejahtera, selamat pagi to all who are here, uh, your excellencies, members of the media, our friends from civil society, um, our panelists who has joined us, YB Imran, uh, this morning. Of course, to YB Wilfred as well, who was unable to join us because of other commitments. Um, my ideas team and uh, ladies and gentlemen. So thank you so much for joining us this morning for our discussion on being towards transparent and accountable state governments, the Malaysian Open Budget Index and Pantau Project. Um, I'm very personally pleased to launch today's two projects, not just one, um, because the work on budget transparency is something that IDEAS has long undertaken for many, many years. We first participated in an international index called the Open Budget Survey, uh, where we do the research and the data collection for this very international uh, survey that looks at how transparent national budgets are. Um, so we've been doing this national level survey for many years. We've been participating actively in the international community. Uh, we're also doing something at the regional level. So while all this has been going on, the team has always also been very, very interested about what happens at that second layer, the sub-national layer, one level below the national, that is most of the time shrouded in secrecy, not much uh, conversation, not much transparency is shed at this level. Ladies and gentlemen, I think over the last two years, we've seen a great unprecedented discussion over state governments. Prior to 2018, we saw the dominant party mostly taking charge of the state governments in Malaysia. 
Therefore, the discussion over federal and state um, perhaps only took place within the opposition-led states of Selangor and Penang and possibly Kelantan as well. But because over the last two years, there has been a lot of, um, one would like to say instability, but we would say that there are changing trends and dynamics in the political situation at the federal and the state levels. So therefore, there has also been this increased level of scrutiny, uh, a great level of attention at what happens at the state government level. This is really important. Um, although the academic literature states that Malaysia is a highly centralized federation, state governments do have jurisdiction over a substantial amount of resources too. And what do they do with these resources is the question that we would like to ask. It is time therefore that attention is spread out in a more diffused manner, not just to scrutinize uh, transparency at the federal level, but also at the state level. Um, citizens have a right to learn about what's happening at the state government level. Citizens have a right to know where their money is being spent, the money that is collected by the state government, not just the federal government. And therefore, this is why understanding what the transparency levels of each state will reveal to us today, that is why that is important. Uh, I'm also going to be a speaker on the panel, so I won't um, speak too much here. I just wanted to share why at this level we are very keen. Uh, the results will be shared with you shortly. Um, but before that, I just want to say that what are the problems of not having a transparent system or a transparent fiscal system? I think number one, we have seen many, many um, public infrastructure projects in the past, for example, uh, shrouded in secrecy. And when these are shrouded in secrecy, there are huge risks that are undertaken where public funds are possibly mismanaged, abused. There is a tremendous amount of leakage. Um, we don't have to go very far and we know that there are national level projects, but do bear in mind that ultimately these projects actually take place within states and state governments do have control over land matters via the Schedule 9 of the federal constitution. So if these projects are actually taking place within the geographical realms of the states, the states have responsibility to be accountable. Uh, they actually have the right to demand what happens to all these public infrastructure projects. Number two, um, without the transparency, the necessary transparency required, we actually don't know as citizens whether or not these projects were feasible to begin with. So one of the things that we look at is also the project feasibility. Um, how are projects chosen? How are they selected? Uh, does it actually make economic sense? Or do the calculations only benefit a certain party? These calculations are what we also have a right to understand and to know. Finally, when there are no rules and these uh, regulatory loopholes exist, uh, we know that third parties and external parties can very well take advantage of these loopholes and regulatory gaps. Uh, so this is why it's important to monitor the projects. So ladies and gentlemen, today we actually have these two very important projects that we are launching. One is the Malaysia Open Budget Index, which provides a budget transparency scorecard for every state measuring the availability of budget documents and the level of oversight by the state assembly. Very, very crucial. And the second one that we're launching is project is a Pantau project or the My Transparency Assessment, where the citizen researchers that we have worked with across the country at the ground level, assess the availability of data on selected state infrastructure projects. Both MyOB and Pantau project, we hope, will set a new benchmark that will bring greater public attention to state budgets and the accountability of state governments for public expenditures. Perhaps in the future, we will go even one step lower in the local government level because local governments also 
control a large amount of resources, procurement, approval of development projects and so on. But we have to take it one step at a time. Uh, for now, we have a national level or international level survey that Malaysia participates in. Today, we launched the national level one, which surveys the states. And we really look forward to the continuity of such a project when we have a long-term projection, only then can we see whether there have been improvements by different states. A final note before I end is just to say that we really greatly encourage political competition. As the states start to see how they score and how they perform vis-a-vis -vis each other, it is really our hope that the states will start to compete and compete for transparency is always a good thing. Um, eventually, we want to see competition not on the basis of race and religion, but competition on the basis of policy, competition on the basis of transparency. Uh, these are the things that are greatly encouraged and I really hope that my OB and Pantau project that we are launching today will contribute to that. As parties compete in the political space, which is perfectly normal, we hope that this is a step forward towards professionalizing politics in the long run. Thank you very much. Thank you, Trisha, for giving us the background on this uh, important project. Now, I would like to invite my colleague, uh, Alisa Road, the manager of Ideas Public Finance Unit, and Arif Najmuddin, research executive at the Public Finance Unit as well, to present the result of Malaysian Open Budget Index and Pantau project. The time is yours now, Alisa, please. Thank you, Uni. Um, good morning, everyone. I will share about our findings from Malaysia Open Budget Index. And later on, Muhammad Arif will share on Pantau project. Um, now, just on why we embarked on this project, it's an initiative to create a greater demand for accountability at the level of state government. And we are looking at uh, citizen demand. So for Malaysia Open Budget Index, which I will call my OB from now on, um, we, we intend to set up a national benchmark for state budget transparency and oversight. And for Pantau project, it is uh, also a citizen-led initiative to track transparency of information on public infrastructure projects in the states. And um, it is a citizen advocacy initiative as well, in the sense that we equipped and encourage uh, re research partners uh, in the different states to conduct uh, the assessments uh, for these projects. Um, why transparency matters? I think uh, Trisha has already covered uh, a lot of the ground that it's on accountability for delivery, and it gives governments a chance to engage citizens on policy and, and you know, with that engagement and transparency, it builds public trust in institutions. Um, and also uh, for states particularly, it puts a spotlight on state policy when there's more information available uh, circulating in media that people can ask and talk about. Um, and it empowers policy research and evaluation. Uh, and it's time that more uh, work is done you know, on state level policies, uh, on state level uh, development. So there are good uh, points as to why uh, state governments should uh, proactively adopt transparency. Now, moving on to the uh, index, before we go into it, I just explain a bit about the methodology and how we went about it. We adapted uh, from open budget survey indicators, which is global benchmark for budget transparency. Uh, the assessment uh, for OBS has many uh, questions, but uh, we adapted to just track uh, four key budget uh, documents and uh, by definition, for a document to be considered publicly available, it has to be provided online, uh, it has to be free to access, and it has to be within a meaningful uh, time frame and within the time frame of the assessment. Um, all questions are scored from zero to 100, and then the average uh, is taken. So when you see the uh, numbers, the score is out of 100, and it's an average of all the questions that we took. Um, for the assessment, we assess 
uh, we look at two dimensions, uh, public availability or transparency, and that's where the uh, rankings uh, come in, uh, and oversight. Uh, under public availability, we have uh, 17 questions, 16 of which are scored, and oversight, uh, just five questions. Uh, and we look at, you know, like I said, four key budget documents. Uh, the main one, uh, moving on to the next slide, would be the executive budget uh, proposal because it lays out the proposed budget plan. Uh, it's the one that contains all the budget details. And uh, in our definition, it comprises the budget speech, uh, the supply uh, bill. Uh, and the estimates of revenue and expenditure. So um, all three of them have to be in there in order to uh, make a good score uh, on the assessment. Uh, in terms of uh, how we went about the project, I won't go too much into detail, but uh, we uh, did uh, submit requests for uh, documents and also requests for uh, state governments to review the scoring. Uh, However, uh, we did not uh, receive uh, replies, uh, and we hope that in future, that in future iterations of the assessment, we would be able to work with state governments on the scoring and the assessment. Uh, we also like to acknowledge uh, all the partners who undertook the Malaysia Open Budget Index uh, assessment. Uh, they have been with us since uh, some since. Uh, early last year and others uh, towards October and December last year, uh, running through the workshops, training on budget cycles and uh, researching the documents. Uh, some of them have also uh, participated in the Pantau project assessment. Uh, and we look forward to developing a larger network of uh, civic-minded individuals and civil society organizations who are interested in budget transparency at the state level. Yeah, so now going into the scores, uh, and this is where we really uh, look at, okay, the total, um, total totality of the assessment. Um, you can see here uh, the top scoring states, Terengganu, Selangor, Negeri Sembilan, uh, Perak Johor, uh, Sabah reached a substantial level of disclosure. Uh, through the publication of key budget documents uh, with a sufficient level of detail, uh, the EBP, Executive Budget Proposal, uh, forms a large part of the weightage. So these states uh, were able to provide uh, some of them more detailed breakdown concerning three types of expenditures, such as functional, administrative, and economic expenditures while also providing information on individual sources of revenue, uh, because we also track uh, the level of quality of information in uh, the EBP. Yeah, for um, states in the middle, like Pulau Pinang, Perlis, and Malacca, um, the budget documents may have been available, but there were insufficient levels of information. Uh, some may not have uh, published the uh, enacted budget or the year-end report. Uh, while EBP uh, may have only comprised like a few documents, uh, quite often it is like the budget speech is available or set of slides on the budget is available, uh, but the detailed breakdown on expenditure and revenue, the estimates are not available. Uh, for the uh, lowest uh, scoring states, uh, there was insufficient disclosure, which indicates that vital budget-related information uh, was missing, or more usually two or three uh, key budget documents um, were missing. Um, for Kerda and Sarawak, the EBP was uh, not available online, and it is the primary document for budget information. Uh, so the information could not be assessed, and that's why the, the uh, weightage is very low. Yeah, so moving on, this is a table that shows the availability of the 
key budget documents that we assess. So the executive budget proposal we assess for the fiscal year 2022. Um, enacted budget, which is what happens after the uh, after the EBP is passed and uh, it's gazetted as uh, the supply bill is gazetted. Yeah. Uh, as the supply enactment or ordinance. So that's what we track. It is uh, only three states uh, publish this on their own. Uh, for other states, it's probably available in the Gazette, but uh, it's not uh, something that public can easily access or find. Uh, Year-end report, uh, five states publish it, and the audit report, uh, for this, we took uh, uh, publications that came off our parliament website. And because it's uh, published by the National Audit Department, so um, all of them were published within the assessment time frame. So yes, on key findings, um, on average, uh, state governments provide minimal disclosure uh, to the public. By that, we mean the average score is uh, 53, and it hasn't hit above uh, 60. Uh, on average. Um, and like I mentioned, the best performing states were able to give detailed breakdowns uh, because they had it in their estimates of uh, revenue and expenditure. And state scoring below average had uh, only partial publication of the EBP. Uh, and with publication of uh, EBP uh, a year-end report, uh, scores would easily increase to the minimal level. Uh, for these states. Uh, and Tranganu was the only state to publish uh, all four documents uh, assessed, and uh, that is what uh, also pushed it up to the first ranking in the MyOB assessment. So in terms of uh, oversight scores for the states, um, the average uh, oversight score is uh, 34. And uh, Trangano uh, also had the highest as their EBP was approved uh, ahead of time and sufficient information was disclosed in state assembly meetings, uh, meaning we also track um, the existence of uh, Penyata Rasmi or Hansard uh, for the state assemblies. Um, so um, it's worth noting that uh, Sarawak had the uh, lowest score zero because its state assembly did not sit in uh, 2021. Uh, the state was under proclamation of emergency Sarawak 2021. Uh, uh, and uh, this was in operation from uh, August to last year to about February this year. And uh, yeah, that, that uh, had an impact on the state's cause. So uh, moving to, I think, just the number of days uh, of Dun sitting, uh, we also track this uh, information uh, through our researchers. And uh, we looked at the number of days that the state assembly sits in 2021, uh, as opposed to uh, 2019. Uh, which we took as a benchmark because 2021 was a COVID year and uh, certain state assemblies may have, like Sarawak, may have been impacted. So um, all the don't set for two sessions in 2021, uh, one of which would have been for the tabling and deliberation of the budget. And uh, as, um, yeah, so we compared it against 2019, and though a majority of states had lesser days in 2021, uh, we can see that sittings in a regular year are not that much higher. Overall, the number of days of the day one undangan negeri sitting is uh, very low for enabling state assembly persons to exercise their oversight role in the assembly. Uh, in so in 2021, the average for Dun sittings was nine days across two sessions, uh, whereas Parliament had a total of 50 days across two sessions uh, in comparison. Uh, Selangor has the highest uh, number of days of sitting, uh, 16 in 2021, despite uh, COVID restrictions. Yeah, for um, I think one thing I want to cover about oversight, which uh, I, I forgot to mention when uh, we were discussing the scores, is that we also track 
um, the review of the public accounts committee. Uh, in order to be scored, the, um, there has to be a record of the public accounts committee reviewing the 2019 uh, audit report, uh, at least like the uh, latest. So, um, Selangor is the only state that publishes uh, and rec records of the public accounts committee uh, meeting. Other states uh, have uh, the state assembly website may list down uh, the members of the public accounts committee, but uh, records are uh, not available. And also, um, yeah, uh, for Selengo, we did not find a record of a review covering 2019. Yeah, so uh, no states reach a score uh, on that question in oversight. So our recommendations uh, in terms of public availability, um, states should aim to make the EBP available, executive budget proposal available online prior to the debate and approval of the budget for public knowledge. Uh, publish the estimate of revenues and expenditures uh, in the EBP as well, uh, in addition to the budget speech. Um, make budget documents available online continuously on the State Assembly website uh, or the Financial Office uh, website. So these were uh, two of the key websites that the researchers uh, trawled through in order to look for the documents. Um, and some states, they may make these documents available for a short while uh, and the link quickly goes dead or it gets uh, taken off. Uh, so we will recommend that keep it on so that people can continuously refer to the budget documents, particularly throughout the year. Um, we also do check on whether there are um, archives. Uh, that is one of the questions for the EBP, uh, archiving uh, of budget back to two, three or five years. Um, in terms of oversight, uh, the number of sitting days for state assemblies needs to be increased. Um, make records of public accounts committee meetings publicly available and also publish state assembly session schedules and uh, hands up on the state assembly website for public information. So on to further steps, we really invite discussion, feedback and involvement uh, launching this inaugural benchmark on uh, Malaysia Open Budget uh, Index. We are still developing the methodology and we hope to do uh, future iterations uh, to continue this uh, benchmark and to see uh, state governments uh, evolving in terms of the public engagement uh, and making budget documents and budget information available. Uh, and we hope to also see you know, uh, state assemblies uh, uh, providing more information on uh, their sessions and public accounts committees providing information on their, uh, on their uh, review meetings. So for experts and practitioners, we look forward to feedback and suggestions on the methodology. Uh, we may hold a workshop or roundtable in the future uh, on this. For government stakeholders, uh, we are open to feedback and discussion as well, and we hope uh, for participation in review uh, of findings in future uh, so that uh, our results reflect current practice. And for civil society and civic-minded persons, uh, if you are interested, uh, you can participate in future workshops and assessment cycles as a partner. So um, yes, with that, I would like to uh, just hand the time over to Arif, who will share about Pantau project. Uh, sorry, okay. Hi, good morning, my name is Arif. And I uh, will be talking on the platform, Panta Project, and also the findings from our research. Panta Project is 
a citizen-led platform that tracks and assess the level of transparency of public infrastructure projects at the state level. Ponta project utilizes an international benchmark adopted from the construction sector transparency initiative assessment into a simpler version, which is the Malaysia infrastructure transparency assessment. So the purpose of Panto project is to assess the accessibility of data and information of state level infrastructure projects. And in addition to create awareness to monitor the use of public resources, Panto project also serves as a platform that provides state government with a benchmark on the level, on the level of information disclosure on infrastructure projects. So Panta project started off by selecting seven states for the pilot study with two infrastructures, with two infrastructure projects assessed within each state. And in total, 14 projects were assessed. And seven partners were then selected and trained by ideas to carry out the research. And in order to assess the level, the accessibility of data and information transparency, Panta project utilizes MITA of Nation Infrastructure Transparency Assessment. And this assessment covers 39 data points or questions highlighting project identification, project preparation, tender management, implementation, and project completion. And moving on to the next slide, what exactly does Panto project evaluate? So there are 39 data points covered by Panto project. And those 39 data points can be divided into five groups. Project identification covers the basic information of a project, such as what is the name of a project, who is the project owner, and what exactly is the purpose of that project. Project preparation covers the information disclosure at the beginning of the project phase. Typically, a project would start by carrying out an assessment of their own, such as an environmental impact assessment, or a land and settlement impact assessment. And then there's the project completion. This data point revolves around the last phase or nearing the completion phase of the project. At this point, we will be assessing the difference at the very beginning of the project and at the end of the project. For example, how much was actually spent on that project compared to the budgeted amount at the beginning. And with there any changes in the scope of completion in the project. And next is the tender management. The section questions the procurement process that was conducted for the project. Who or which entity handles the procurement part of the project? The type of procurement process involved to award the project or how many numbers of firms are tendering for that particular project. And lastly is the implementation. Is the implementation the purpose of assessing implementation of the project is to determine whether the project went through any variation or changes throughout the whole duration of the project. So variation would pretty much involve uh, changes in contract prices, duration of contract or the contract scope itself, and were there any particular reasons for the changes to be made. <clears throat> so how do we exactly get the answers to these 39 data points or questions? The answers can be sourced from either a website prepared or set up by the state government or the project owner, or the information was gathered from a third party website, for example, a news article, or the information is not available online. And moving on to the next slide. <clears throat> So the process of selecting state infrastructure projects were done by identifying projects that was mentioned in the budget speeches or in budget documents such as budget speeches from 2015 to 2020. And the reason why we're choosing this time frame of years is to ensure that the project has already started or some aspect of the projects is substantially underway. And other sources of identifying the projects were also done by looking through tender documents and looking at the Rasmi or handsets of state assemblies. So the criteria in choosing these projects for this assessment are the project should be owned or funded by a public entity. In this case, public entity refers to state governments, state-owned enterprises or statutory bodies. And in the case of private-public partnership, 
this project should be <coughs> this project should be identifiably initiated by the state government and the infrastructure projects were chosen that were chosen covers a wide range of infrastructures uh, cover a wide range of infrastructures project such as tourism housing and urban development transportation utilities public facilities and irrigation i'm moving on to the next slide so this is the summary of project data points this slide shows the summary of 39 data points of food of 14 projects total, totaling from seven states based on the summary of data and information disclosure we can see that the color green is not as much as compared to the other two colors and this indicates that information disclosed by a state government or project owner is not that adequate. Most of the information that resulted in the green colored bars were actually sourced from tender documents. For example, if you take a look at Selangor Flood Deterrence Project for Semenyeh River or Selangor install installation of water supply to Kampung Orang Asli, those were sourced from tender documents. Meanwhile, the yellow the yellow colored bars indicate that the infrastructure projects at the state level generally receive high level of media exposure, especially for large interest infrastructure projects that generate high public interest. For example, the Penang South Island and the Penang Undersea Tunnel. There is a severely lack of information disclosed in official portals, and most of it comes from media, uh, from media portals. And lastly, we can see that the color red takes half of the bar chart and this is because the information leading to the projects could not be found by the researchers at the time of the assessment although there are efforts to publish the, uh, to publish the information on the projects the information provided are still missing out the key important details such as standard management and the implementation phase of the project for example we can see at the slide at this slide here these are some of the examples of questions where the state governments did not manage to score. We can see that information on the number of firms tendering for the project is only disclosed by Penang, whereas the other states did not provide this information. Well, although Penang managed to get a score, however, the reason was because the information was sourced from a third party website specifically from a news article, online news article. And the same goes for the reason why the project went through changes in terms of scope, equation, or cost. And these information are considered as basic information that should be disclosed by the state government. And moving on to the next slide. So what can the state government do? Although one of the dissemination methods uh, the state government use is to provide media reports to the media partners the effort the effort of disclosing this vital and basic information should come directly from the state government it is true that the information is there online however the information is scattered around the web consolidate consolidating this information in, this information into a single platform or a dashboard would be one of the best practices that the state government do. And the same type of disclosure level should not only be applied to big infrastructure projects, but it should also cover all types of projects, regardless of their scale or budget. And this is because it involves public resources and have a high interest from the public. And next is different types of procurement should also have the same level of transparency. Whether the project was awarded through direct negotiation or PPP or PPP. And this is because state government websites would only provide information relating on or relating to tenders. And there is in fact a website that shows the information on PPP. However, again, the information is scattered. For a normal person who doesn't know anything about infrastructure projects, it would be difficult for them to get this kind of information. And lastly, this, what the state government could do is state government need to understand on the importance of a centralized procurement platform. Out of 13 states in Malaysia, only four states 
have a proper centralized procurement platform with an archive of its own, which allows access to fast awarded tenders or fast echo tenders. And to wrap up Panta project, we hope that with Panta project, we can see improvement in disclosure, in disclosure practices by the state government. And that is all from me. Thank you. I will pass on the next session to Alisa. Thank you. Uh, yeah, actually, it, it will go to Uni, but uh, just to, uh, just in sense of uh, wrapping up uh, and moving back to the data points here, um, the data points with the high green, as Arif mentioned, uh, were the ones where the projects uh, were actually uh, tendered on the centralized uh, procurement website, like for Selengo. Uh, and for other projects, like uh, particularly large projects like in Penang, the South Islands, Penang Undersea Tunnel, uh, the Sarawak New Museum, and the Darul Hana Bridge, um, quite a lot of the information uh, was sourced from uh, uh, information that may have come from the government, but through third party, like such as uh, media, uh, uh, like press conferences or press statements, news. Uh, which were eventually picked up by news articles. Um, and also uh, in terms of uh, Penang South Islands, because it's a developing project, uh, there was an older environmental impact assessment report that was uh, placed uh, on the uh, Department of Environment uh, website. So it's a federal website. It's not considered the state government website, but that information was captured. Uh, so just as uh, you know, Arif noted, I think the state governments maybe make a, an effort to convey information because we can see green plus yellow hits uh, for some projects hits uh, at least the halfway mark, but uh, consolidation of that uh, you know, in a centralized uh, website in, by the project owner, uh, by the state uh, would be uh, very useful for tracking information and engaging. All right, thank you. And over to Moon. Moon. Thank you, Alisa and Ari for such insightful presentations. And I think now all of us know that Terengganu uh, and Selangor both are the highest performer in terms of public availability. These two states publish four key budget documents that uh, provide the public with the information on estimates of revenue and expenditures uh, as well as uh, documents on the implementations of the budget or the, the annual financial statements. Uh, however, as Alisa pointed earlier, there are still many states that still not publish these key budget documents. So I think, uh, and, and of course, we also heard about the Pantau project where most of the information uh, while are available on the government website, but most of them, some, some of the information, especially in regards to procurement process and also uh, the, the completion of the project are not available to the public. Uh, I will not uh, comment further, but I will uh, now, let's hear from the insight from our distinguished speakers here, YB, Mohammed Imran and also Trisha, but I will ask Trisha to start first. Uh, uh, Trisha will share her responses to the result of the assessment and also I think talks a little bit about the need for fiscal for transparency and I think fiscal decentralization in Malaysia um, and of course on federal and, and state relations when it comes to um, uh, development project as well as on on any related on any fiscal matters. So Trisha has written quite extensively on federal state relations and also the governance and politics of selected state governments. And in fact, Trisha, if you don't mind, I see just successfully defended her PhD thesis on the examine federal state relations and opposition uh, subnational durability within dominant party authoritarian regimes, just I think early this month. So, so, so congratulations for that. And without further ado, please, uh, Trisha, the time is yours. Okay, thank you so much, Uni. Uh, thank you for the surprise announcement as well. Um, so I just, I, I don't have like a main presentation to give, but I think I'll just respond to the findings um, 
internally, I mean, that, that ideas has done, as well as maybe talk a little bit about um, my own research and my own experience in studying, you know, state level matters. And then if there are any specific questions, uh, please do feel free to ask like how, you know, we try and make these connections together. So um, I think firstly, again, I am just like, this is something that I've been waiting for for a really long time. I think we've been in discussion in trying to do something like this for at least, you know, five to eight years. Um, and to see it coming to fruition today, it's very, very rewarding. Um, not just personally, but I think institutionally as ideas has championed budget transparency for so long. Um, I really hope that the scores that screen, um, that, uh, that that is something that we will share quite widely because the scores that compare all the different states um, will be very useful. I hope that not just state governments, but state legislative assembly persons, all of the aduns, uh, both whether government, backbenchers, opposition, uh, YB Imran over here is a member of the opposition of the Selang or state government, uh, they'll be able to utilize these scores and to demand for even more information that's provided from the government. Um, so firstly, you know, congratulations to the state of Trunganu for doing so well. Uh, I hope that this will give Trungano state government more inspiration to, to do well. And of course, uh, to Selangor, Negeri Sembilan, Perak, and then of course, Johor and Sabah. Um, the states of uh, Kedah, Sarawak, Pahang and Kelantan obviously will need to do better in terms of what they disclose, uh, as well as Malacca, Perlis and Penang. I think this is something that perhaps the Penang and um, the Penang state government might want to take cognizance of as well because of the fact that they regularly talk about the principles of CAT, uh, competency, accountability and transparency. So this is an area that certainly the Penang state government should improve upon. Um, so if I just have, maybe let, let me just kind of start off with like three main points and then after that we'll get the discussion going because I... I I, I'm not sure like what you, you, you want this uh, panel now to, to focus on. So number one, um, I think it's very, very clear that there has not been enough attention on the state government level. So every year, the media goes crazy when it comes to the national budget. There is so much attention, so much, um, you know, news time is, is spent on the national level budget, but who is writing and who is actually reporting on state level budgets? Um, I used to work uh, for the Selangor state government. And so that's when I would scrutinize it. I would compare the budgets between Selangor and the other states. But I don't think many people uh, or even back then or even now are doing that kind of analysis. Um, and then maybe just to share like an, an anecdote as well about my own uh, experience doing my PhD research. So of course, I'm looking at budget documents as well as budget speeches from the two states of Selangor and Penang, which are the states that I study, but also the other states across the country. And it is, I, I didn't have um, this kind of research method methodology of our research team but I was just doing it on my own and it was really difficult to find. There was no standardized uh, place or repository to collect all of these budget documents. Uh, only very few states, as you can now see, um, have the, the enacted budget, which is actually the budget document itself. So the budget speech is not the budget, but the, the, the actual enacted budget document is. Um, and uh, yeah, so in the Penang state government case, um, the only way I could access the budget documents was to actually visit the library of uh, the Ting Tang Penang Institute. So anyone, say like a researcher based in KL or Johor or overseas would not be able to access it because it's not available online. Um, and I visited the state government office and I asked, uh, he was, you know, the, the officer had the document open in front of me. But I asked, like, could I see at least just that one table because it's really important to know what the numbers are, and you know, it was not, it was not uh, permissible to do that. So I think 
um, there's this culture of secrecy and hiding behind certain rules, uh, whatever those rules are, which is quite detrimental because um, even if the states have the freedom of information enactment, um, applying for the FOI enactment is actually very cumbersome. So by default, the state governments should provide information um, automatically by default. Uh, so that's the, the first point in terms of like the budget transparency availability. Basically, the findings of the MyOB um, validate, or, or rather my experience validates the findings of the MyOB in a very real way uh, in terms of difficulty of finding uh, information and data and researchers have to mine so much, you know, spend so much time mining uh, budget speeches and so on. Um, the second point is on the second point is on fiscal decentralization. So um, I mean today we're talking about about budget transparency and about transparency of projects. Um, my, my research, I have basically talked about why it is that it's important for more decentralization of not just the money and budgetary matters, but of function. So I have argued in some of my papers that especially the functions of education and health as public service provision should be eventually decentralized to the state level uh, because it's based on the principle of subsidiarity where the lowest level um, service provider should, should provide that access to the citizens because it's the closest that, it, that, that they would have in terms of proximity to the actual citizens themselves. Um, and you see throughout the pandemic, for example, that if certain decisions were actually decentralized to the state government or even the local government, some of these things could have been expedited in a, in a faster manner. But we can't talk about decentralization without fiscal decentralization because um, if, and the experience of other countries around the world have shown that when public service um, delivery is decentralized to the states, but not at the same time the fiscal, so if, it's if it is still fiscally centralized, but you're decentralizing the functions, then decentralization is not going to work. So um, I think in the future, one thing that we could possibly think about is how do we empower the, state, the states by having a greater fiscal collection? Um, and one of the solutions might be to return a portion of certain taxes that are collected by the central government to the state. So what, would, what, what kinds of taxes, right? That would be the next question. I think under the Pakatan Harapan administration, the federal government actually returned a percentage of tourism tax to the states. So that was the very first time that there was some kind of um, uh, tax sharing going on, um, but that was not legislated for. So I think it's, it's it's important to know whether this, this is institutionalized and whether this is continuing under the PN government. I don't think it is. Uh, so tourism tax is one. And then the other one is um, in some countries around the world, in some federations around the world, they actually collect a form, the states actually collect a form of sales and service tax or a value added tax. So there's a lot of discussion going on now on GST, um, whether or not this is something that the states might eventually you know, be able to pursue, but this requires a lot of changes to the laws. Uh, but going back to the issue of transparency, um, I think if the states are going to be given greater empowerment, it has to come coupled with transparency as well. So the more power you give to the states, yes, the more autonomy you give to the states, states need to increase, we need to pressure the states to increase their transparency because it doesn't work if it doesn't come hand in hand. Uh, greater accountability, greater autonomy must come with the exchange of greater transparency. Um, and then the third point is on the, the presentation of Arif about the projects and the, the transparency level of the projects. So, uh, I mean, I completely agree with the recommendation that there needs to be a standardized um, 
there needs to be a standardized portal that describes the nature of all these projects, that describes the methodology of the procurement of all of these projects. Um, but I just want to say that as far as Malaysia's federal state relations are concerned, um, Sometimes it's very tricky because the projects, and I think citizens don't know enough about this, like are the projects federal projects or are they state projects? So um, how do we like demand accountability when some of these projects are even a combination of both, right? So they could be joint venture projects between a federal and a state level agency. Uh, so whose responsibility is it to provide that level of transparency? Um, and I think just a short note about um, the politicization of projects. I think this is not really something that we've managed to cover in our methodology because it really just looks at the transparency levels. But again, in my research, and I've interviewed like a lot of people, uh, it's so clear that if you, if the state government is aligned with the party or coalition that is at the federal government level, um, it is more likely that they will get projects or it is more likely that funding will come down to that particular state. So uh, in the long run, I hope that, I think, I think transparency is also a tool that can shed light on this. Um, you know, maybe future iterations of our project will be able to demonstrate like what is the amount of money in, project, in terms of projects? What is the amount of project funding that is obtained by state governments when they are aligned with the federal government and how much of that is received when they are not aligned with the federal government and whether or not over a long period of time, we can see that there are significant differences between the time when the state government is occupied by uh, a federal aligned or an opposition state. Um, because ultimately, you know, we should not be punishing citizens for voting for the party of their choice. Um, and, and definitely projects need to be need, need to follow as well so projects must be considered neutral um i i know for for example of another colleague researcher of mine who is trying to examine um a longitudinal study of whether hospitals so public hospitals um the investment into public hospitals and the selection of the area of the public hospitals whether or not that follows the, the, the political um, inclinations of that particular leader in the state. So if an election is coming, um, the selection of a certain geographical area to implement a public hospital. So I think some of this research really needs to be unpacked a lot further. But I think this is just the beginning for us in terms of the Pantau project. And I look forward to seeing more. So I'll just stop there now. If you have any specific questions, um, please let me know. Thank you. Thank you, Trisha, to start the discussions. I think we can, the, the, the focus of our discussion today, unpacking the both of the result of Pantau project as well as the uh, my OB. However, insights from you on the fiscal decentralizations and how is it important for how transparency can actually have a, a good, uh, is an important element within it. I think there are some requests in the past two years for, for state governments to be more fiscally decentralized. And I think transparency will be an important element in that. I, I would like to invite uh, YB Imran. Uh, YB Imran uh, Tamrin is uh, the current member of Selangor State Assembly from Sungai Panjang. Uh, he's also holding position of executive committee in both the national and Selangor Amno Youth Wing. So YB, uh, I would love to hear your reactions on the, on the result. And I think it would, if you could comment and on the oversight as well, I would be very um, excited to hear. The time is yes, YP. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Um, very good morning. Uh, thank you, uh, Moon, and also Trisha as panels, um, um, members of our audience, Your Excellency and ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, thank you, uh, Ideas, for uh, inviting me to participate uh, in this uh, uh, presentation uh, regard regarding the MyOB and Pantau project. Um, in view of um, 
Selangor State Legislative Assembly, um, yes, uh, as, as informed by uh, Ms. Uh, Madam Moderator, uh, I am representing opposition uh, PAC in, uh, in, in, in Selangor. Um, uh, first, I would like to congratulate lah, um, Terengganu State Government uh, uh, as the result of the, the, the transparency on, on, on their budgeting and, and the availability of the document uh, that they publish uh, in, the, in the online uh, platform. Um, I believe um, most of states now uh, publish uh, at least uh their their speech uh, on the budget and also the the, the budget book uh, for each and every state uh, and every year they they they, they, they present uh, online each and every state but um in the future uh, i trust that uh, ideas uh, should engage uh, personally or specifically uh, the state government and also the state perbendaharaan uh, to get more inside information uh, in terms of budget planning. Uh, maybe maybe um, state, for example, Selangor or Terengganu or any other states uh, should invite uh, institutions like IDEAS during the budget engagement and uh, the budget preparation for the state because uh, this is important, the participation of the third party uh, during the budget preparation is uh, among other uh, important things that the state uh, should, should look into uh, for their initiative. Because uh, sometimes, uh, as informed by Trisha just now, um, we are sometimes uh, bound uh, by certain rules and regulations uh, based on uh, presentation just now, uh, among the among uh, recommendation uh, uh, such as um, EBD or executive uh, budget proposal uh, must be presented or must be made available before or prior the budget presentation in the uh, state legislative assembly. Uh, sometimes. Uh, it's, it is um, uh, uh, we are bound by law lah. Uh, we cannot uh, we cannot uh, uh, expose whatever whatever specific and details on the budget but uh, to promote transparency to promote competency accountability and transparency uh, CAT CAT uh, I think uh, the government uh, may uh, may publish or made available the summary of the budget, summary of the proposed budget uh, on the key areas and everything so that um, not necessarily the public, but we also as a position, we, we know what are the budgets or what are the planning by the governments. Because the culture and the practice now normally the budget is prepared among the government and executive, meaning that the executive, the government, and also their backbenchers always have their pre-council first prior to the budget presentation. But uh, we in the opposition side, we don't know what are really, uh, what the real budget that our government is preparing uh, so that if the government is ready uh, to, to be more transparent, so the, the budget proposal at least uh, a week or a month before the budget presentation uh, must make available the executive summary or the, uh, some, some key points uh, in the budget uh, proposal. So there is one. Um, in terms of the 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 accountability it depends on the each and every state is different different uh, resources of budget uh, for example um, in Selangor in average our yearly budget uh, in Selangor is uh, around two billion but most of the state in Malaysia uh, less than 
1 billion or, or up to 1.5 billion. Uh, there are several states. For example, Selangor, Johor, Sabah and Sarawak, I think uh, their budget is, is rich or more than 2 billion a year. This compared to national level at parliament level, whereby our national budget is 100 billion a year. So the accountability among this budget must be put very clear, uh, which is the state budget and what are, what are accountable by the state and what are accountable by the, the, the federal. And again, uh, when we talk about projects, there are several projects are funded uh, purely or 100% by the state and some of the project are uh, combined uh, from the state budget and also the, the federal budget on certain project. But always the accountability must be put on the uh, implementer, whatever agency uh, must be transparent. Either the agency is come from the federal agency or either it is from the state agencies. Um, and I think um, uh, based on whatever finding that ideas uh, come out this morning in the my OB. Um, I think um, for the future, uh, both uh, uh, government and the ideas or any other institutions uh, shall have or government must make available for a discussion for is for the discussion uh, between the researchers because sometimes. Uh, if we look into uh, executive budget proposal, it is uh, very thick and it is uh, time consuming um, for us, even as a members of the Ahli Dewan, uh, to go into the details and to scrutinize each and everything uh, of the budget proposal. And uh, another thing is to empower the legislative institution uh, because um, uh, this morning, uh, based on the presentation, we can look how many days uh, as, 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 as a state assemblyman we, we discuss and we debate on the issues for Selangor, okay, uh, 17 to 16 days a year. Uh, but this is very important if we can increase the numbers of this, uh, the numbers of sitting days in the state legislative, in the state legislative assembly. Uh, because uh, because the, the time uh, nowadays uh, for the Selangor, the time allocated for the debate is only for one week uh, to debate on the on the executive budget proposal and then to debate for each and every details uh, of the budget proposal. So we only have one week, but sometimes each and every members only given 10 to 15 minutes to debate uh, on the certain uh, issues. So this is very important. First is time allocated to the Ahli Dewan to participate, to debate, and to scrutinize, study uh, the budget. And second is the participations. Um, we must promote uh, our members of uh, legislative assembly, our Wakil Rakyat, Adun, and also MP2, participate uh, in the debate and also in the discussion on the on the budget on the yearly budget and third the important things that we must also look into uh, in terms of the legislative uh, institutions uh, we must uh, make available the tools and support uh, to the members of the legislative especially for the oppositions so the opposition must be given uh, at least a researcher or access or some allocation uh, to engage on the third party uh, researcher or, or, or even uh, an institution, uh, third party institution uh, to help us preparing and uh, make sure whatever we deliver in the, in the state legislative uh, can uh, real check and balance the government. Uh, or else uh, the government will take advantage of their position, of their political position. For example, in uh, Selangor State Legislative Assembly, uh, after PRU 14, we only have four 
four oppositions to compete uh, uh, more than 50, 50 uh, from the government, including the executive and also the backbenchers. So uh, sometimes this will 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 give uh, an opportunity an opportunity or or chances uh, for the government to hide behind the transparency, accountability, and their competency because of the lack of uh, monitoring uh, from the opposition. So, for example, yes, in Selangor, uh, they empowered our opposition led uh, opposition leader Ketua Pembangkang to be to be a PAC or Public Account Committee uh, leader uh, in Jawatan Kuasa PAC, but sometimes to get um, to get the numbers or to get um, a slot to conduct the PAC also sometimes uh, quite difficult to, to get the time. So this is also uh, very important uh, for us to promote and to engage uh, each and every uh, day one uh, negeri in each every state to empower and to give more uh, opportunity to the PAC, but but it is good for Negeri Selangor because our PAC sitting or PAC uh, meeting are conducted live uh, in the in the online 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 platform. Uh, our PAC hearing, our PAC meeting are conducted live. Uh, so everyone can see and everyone can uh, can 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 look into whatever uh, discuss or, or or hear the, during the PhD meeting. And also uh, when re when it regards to the rules and regulations, uh, we also need to to get more engagement and get uh, more inside view and to dive deep. To, to know further what is the reason behind certain rules. Uh, they, I, I believe there must be uh, an explanation and rationale uh, why certain rules uh, implemented or put, uh, especially uh, with regard to the uh, budget. Uh, when we talk about transparency, the transparency for me must be guided. It must be guided by certain rules and regulation. It cannot be uh, totally transparent. Uh, there must be a reason behind why certain rule imposed and why certain rule enacted uh, with regard to the uh, that that restrict certain transparency uh, in terms of the budget. But in general, uh, budget which is using the public fund or the rakyat money. Uh, must be made available, especially in terms of their preparation, in terms of their proposal, and also in terms of their implementations. Uh, with regard to the second part, to Pantau project, certain uh, project uh, which are uh, beneficial to the public and also announced uh, by the state or by the federal government, which uh, involve a certain amount or huge amount of allocation uh, must be must be made available to the public in terms of their timeline and also in terms of their deliveries. This is very important. And also maybe in terms of how uh, the budget or the project being executed, uh, for example, the tender process, who got the tender, and uh, what is the timeline, the, the delivery of the specific project. But not all the projects. Certain projects, mega project, huge project, and budget, and and also project that will give a benefit uh, to the to the people, either in the state or in the federal government. So, I think um, <laughs> I think to promote to promote uh, the transparency and the accountability, I think uh, that uh, that there are certain certain areas that we also need to look into together. Thank you, IB. Thank you, IB. Uh, we have many questions uh, in already. Um, thank you for, for these questions, but I think let's, uh, let's go to one of the questions from the uh, participants. And please, for those who join us from Facebook, and you can put questions in the comments, our team will copy paste the questions into the Zoom platform, and then we will be able to ask the question to the panel. Uh, I think I will ask, uh, there are several questions for the research team, especially on the uh, project. 
So I think uh, there are questions on uh, whether the Pantau project uh, tool also uh, also track the feasibility studies, the availability of feasibility studies. And the second one, whether we also uh, assess or, or the possibility of assessing in the future uh, in complete project. So I think Arif or Alisa, if you can take this question. Okay, I will take on uh, feasibility studies. Uh, for this one, the data points that we track does not include a uh, feasibility study. We do track uh, whether there is uh, environmental impact. Uh, so whether an environmental impact assessment report uh, is available. Uh, and uh, I we we did not do summative finding of uh, uh, EIA because the way we summarize is by uh, project. But uh, if I recall, not uh, there were very few uh, where we could actually make get hold of a full uh, EIA report. Yeah. Are we for the second questions on the incomplete project? Are we? Is there any within the uh, 14 projects that we have? Or is in there any all, in the future? Yeah, so in all of the 14 projects, there is one project where we assess the housing development. I believe it was the, uh, it, uh, it was in Kelantan, Maranti housing project, I believe. And for, yeah, that is the only housing project that we assess. But there is a platform, or not a platform, but a list of uh, rumah terbengkalai uh, that KPKT had prepared in the website. And yeah, that is only for, yeah, that is for the housing projects. Only one that we assessed. Yeah. Thank and you, Arif. I hope that answered the question uh, from the audience. Uh, are there questions about the whether we will share the documents that are presented today. We will circulate the slides to those who attended the event today. And a summary report will also be available uh, on our website. But we also actually, today, we will also launch a new platform, a new website called Panta Wangkita, which will host all these findings on the same platform. So you will be able to see uh, the result for each state and we will, uh, Arif, my, Arif and Alisa will also uh, uh, guide us in, in uh, uh, browsing this website later. So there are three other questions, I think. Uh, one for uh, Trisha. So I think this is the questions on taxes, whether uh, state governments are allowed to have other taxes other than land and uh, land assessment tax, and also uh, there are several state uh, taxes also specific to Sabah. I think they, he, uh, the, the, the audience wants to comment, uh, your comments on this. Okay, uh, so this issue on tax is really interesting, right? I mean, it's a very boring subject, can be very dry, but I mean, ultimately it is about money and how, how state or how governments uh, in general use the money, that where they get the money from, it really is from taxes. So um, yeah, you're right. I think as far as the peninsula state governments are concerned, they are only allowed to, um, to tax on land and assessment. Um, the Sabah and Sarawak sales tax on palm oil and petroleum, actually that was also legally contested initially. So if you remember um, Sarawak state government, so this is separate from the royalty discussion, right? On oil, uh, the, Sarawak, the Sarawak state government imposed uh, um, a five percent sales tax on oil and gas that was taken from the state, and this actually went up to the court. And it was only after the the court in Sabah, uh, I think it was the Sabah High Court, uh, ruled that that it was allowed that both Sabah and Sarawak uh, were allowed to impose the sales tax. Only then. Um, Petronas was forced to do it and even then it took a long time and only finally so all of these legal disputes were taking place um, you know throughout 2018 2019 2020 and then only finally when the PN government came into power that 
they paid out the sales tax. And this sales tax was controversial as well because um, we have a Petroleum Development Act and Petronas itself was also, I think, I think the leadership of Petronas itself was also in conflict as to whether or not the sales tax should be paid uh, to Sarawak. They, some, some believe that it was a double payment um, on top of what was already being paid. Uh, and, and this was a case that I actually followed quite closely. So anyway, ultimately the payment was given, um, but I think not without some controversy uh, in Petronas, including the possible, um, let's not say removal, but uh, perhaps short, a shorter lived stint um, of high level individuals within the national oil company that, uh, that, that was a result of, of all of this dispute. Um, so then Sabah followed suit. So Sarawak claimed the sales tax first and then Sabah followed suit. But coming back to your question, um, whether or not this is something other states can impose, at the moment, my understanding is that it is not possible. So only Sabah and Sarawak can do this. Um, and then your next question is, should state-based taxes be encouraged? Uh, I have recommended this in one of my papers that a form of state-based uh, sales and service tax be encouraged for the reason that, um, so if you're thinking about the way a product is sold, the product that is sold within that particular state. So I think then the, the question will be like, when should a sales tax be imposed within a particular state? Like when the company is, uh, you know, when the manufacturer, the producer, um, the supply chain, maybe, maybe it has to do with the supply chain, like a certain percentage of the supply chain exists within the domain of that state itself, then the sales tax can be imposed. So I think, there's a lot of questions um, around this, which I would love to write a separate paper on, uh, which actually I have a draft on. Um, but uh, yeah, I think the, the very specific details of like, if we encourage states to impose sales tax, how do we do it? Like what's the mechanism? What's the quantum? And how do we, what's the determinant of such a sales tax and what the percentage would be? But I think if it's based on the principle that um, that most of the production is taking place within that state, that is what I would definitely agree with. Uh, but I want to talk about why we want states to actually have a greater amount of resources, right? So the reason is that um, at the moment, so as we know, states are restricted to a limited number of kinds of revenues. And this is a problem especially in the poorer states, which are less urbanized, because then what happens is they tend to rely on natural resources. Um, so if you think of states like Johor, Selangor, and Penang, which are more industrialized, they can get their tax and their, their revenues from land because their land, um, the, the prices of land are higher. So the, the returns that they get whenever somebody buys a property or converts the property from agriculture to commercial, then you get a lot of money from that, right? The premiums and so on. But for the smaller rural states where the land, um, the, the, the price of land is so low, they don't get very much from their assessment and other forms of taxes, land taxes, that they have to depend on natural resources. And this is also why you start to see uh, more logging and the flooding and so on. So it has a direct relationship, a direct correlation with the environment factor and climate change. So as the discussions on ESG increase, that is in parallel with how states should be given uh, greater autonomy. Um, okay, I think there was one more question addressed to me. Uni, should I answer that? Yeah, now? The, I think, I know there's a question from Arif Anwar, which is also quite interesting, but you can make, can you like, uh, yeah, have a shorter answer for that? Just yeah, right, sure, right, sure, right, sure. Okay, that. The okay. Sabah state, Sabah government recently give autonomy to local authorities regarding solid waste, which is another decentralization to even lower level. Is it allowed actually within our system? Uh, it's a, again a, a tricky question because we do have a national act on solid. So we have a solid a solid waste management act at the national level. Um, this came about like around 2015, 2016. 
And by right, it was supposed to centralize all solid waste management of the entire country. And um, the Solid Waste Management Authority actually even identified specific companies that would take care of certain regions in the peninsula. I'm not sure actually whether this Solid Waste Management Act uh, was applied to Sabah and Sarawak. I would assume so, uh, but I would have to check. Anyway, the, the, short, the short answer is that several state governments opted out of the centralization um, mechanism. At that time, of course, Selangor, Penang, and Perak. And interestingly, even when Perak changed government back to the Barisan National Government, Perak also chose to opt out of the system because they felt that they could make it more cost efficient by decentralizing it to their local governments. So local governments uh, would handle the solid waste management, which has always been the case before the Act came in. Um, but yeah, I think Sabah is an interesting case study. I will need to check that out. Thank you. Thank you, Trisha. Uh, there's a question from Moon Hong Fong on why certain states do better. Uh, Terengganu, Terengganu here, of course, whether Terengganu has good fiscal practices or not. I think research team Alisa and, and Arif can, can give uh, insight into this. But I think YB also from, from your side, one, for example, Selangor also almost matched Terengganu. What makes Selangor, I think, have these good fiscal practices? Alisa, I think you can, you can take the time first. Okay, I will take uh, this very shortly. Uh, I would say I wish I knew because uh, you know anything I say about Trangano would be speculation since uh, we are not able to engage uh, with the state government. And if any of you from uh, Trangano state government are here, we hope that you know you, uh, we'll be able to speak to you and find out uh, really exactly why. Um, in I think uh, just looking at the website, right? Uh, for the uh, Trangano state government, the Satya Usaha Kerajaan, um, you'll be surprised to find that actually there is an open data tab that you can click in and there are data sets um, available and uh, each data set is scored like uh, there's a star scoring, like you know, two star or four star or five star. Um, so it appears that uh, even though there's maybe no freedom of information law in Trangano, but there's, there's uh, an awareness there and the uh, websites are you know, well running with a lot of data and there's some sort of concerted uh, uh, like move towards like uh, uh, providing open data. Um, Selangor of course has uh, you know, information I think I'll leave YB to, to discuss that. And uh, Penang does too, but uh, Penang is not scored as well in the uh, budget transparency. So it really comes down to a, a drive to do it on awareness, I think. Uh, over to, to you, YB. Yeah, YB. And also probably there's another question on PAC, if you can also uh, talk about your experience in PAC as well as what would be the motivation for Selangor and even other states to have a, a better transparency, please. Um, um well, thank you for the question uh, regarding the PSC. Um, actually, um, uh, to to answer this uh, question, uh, first of all, I am not a member. I'm not a member of uh, PSC uh, for the Selangor State uh, uh, Assembly. Uh, the members of PSC are chaired by the opposition leader, and also uh, the members of the PSC will be. Um, the chief of the uh, government backbenches, and also uh, representative from 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 uh, other parties uh, in the uh, in the state legislative assembly uh, from from AMNO, from uh, PAS, and also uh, Pejuang and the others lah. Um, in terms of um, improvement uh, that may be required by the PSC, uh, first, firstly is the, the resources. Uh, the, the, the position leader uh, must have uh, full access and resources uh, to get more information uh, and also support uh, from, the, from the machineries of the government. Uh, whenever issue arose uh, with regard to the government agencies or government initiatives. Uh, for Selangor PAC, there are several. Uh, there are numbers of the sitting uh, discussing a very important issue, uh, for example, uh, regarding the uh, 
uh, government uh, company or MBI and, and also several other government uh, agencies. Uh, PAC also discussed with regard to um, uh, state expenditure, but uh, the important thing is whatever uh, whatever rules or whatever findings uh, found in the PAC meeting, the government must take it serious and must uh, take certain uh, action uh, on whatever on whatever proposal proposed by the PAC and even whatever and even the proposal and also the finding by PAC uh, are table uh, during the during the state assembly the debates so this must be taken seriously by the government but sometimes uh, the government just 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 here and take note on whatever proposal but at the end of the day no monitoring on the on the action taken by the government so uh, the next uh, if we if we want to bring the PAC uh, if we want to bring the PAC more resourceful and more uh, we, we must uh, apa nama ni? we must monitor uh, the action from the government. The monitoring, uh, we are now lacking on the monitoring side of the government action for now for PAC. YB, just, just a follow-up question to that since you are also you also raised the importance of increasing uh, days, for example, before the this, even PAC, you have PAC, but it's very difficult to schedule a meeting. What would be the first step if we want to make these changes? Is there like is, is are all of these regulated in the standing orders or or how if we want to make these changes how should we do it and what is the possibility of of actually making these changes possible? Um, to make the changes possible, uh, uh, the main important thing is to give the the full empowerment uh, for the state legislative institutions because uh, now the speakers and also the state legislative institution is still uh, tied to the executive. That's why sometimes we cannot, uh, all the state legislative institutions uh, cannot do more to, to do the check and balance uh, because we are still uh, tied with the executive then, um, then in the long run or in the future, uh, we must promote to to give a real uh, doctrine in separation of power between executive and legislative institution. This is this is very important. If we to if we really to empower our members of legislative assembly and also the legislative institutions uh, to do more on the on the check and balance to the government uh, policies and whatever government do. Thank you, Ivy. Uh, there are uh, several questions in relation to the scope of the research. I think there's one question from uh, Anonymous. Uh, why like that the perimeter should be should include also uh, GLC and state-owned enterprises. And, and also, I think it's very interesting uh, input from Jeffrey here on on including uh, the tracking of uh, uh, guidelines for the PBT so that the, the budget process at the PBT level can also be transparent. I think, Alisa, if you want to comment on this, please. Okay, so on uh, the perimeter of investigation, I, I think this is referring to a uh, Pantau project, right? Whether we will cover uh, uh, Alisa, I think we, we could we can't hear you. Oh, some point. can you hear me? All right. Yes, now yes. Yeah. So on the perimeter of investigation, I, I think this is referring to a uh, Pantau uh, project and whether we cover uh, GLCs and uh, state-owned enterprises. Uh, we are looking at project infrastructure as a scope, and some of these projects are actually uh, run by uh, state-owned enterprises or, or GLCs. Uh, so that's, uh, it's actually part of the, the project. It depends, it just depends on whether the state uh, government runs it 
uh, specifically uh, or not. And uh, later when we show the, the website, you will be able to go into each project and see uh, the one of the first few key data points is actually who is the, the project owner uh, in this case. Uh, and it is uh, true that uh, when the project goes through a GLC or state-owned enterprise, uh, the, their, procure, their procurement process is not captured on a state centralized uh, procurement uh, uh, websites, for example. Uh, and that was also one of the recommendations that we made, that regardless of the type of procurement, uh, if and the project owner, if it's a GLC, a SOE, it should uh, still go through a same uh, transparent procurement process. Yeah. Um, on on the on the last question, I think from Jeffrey whether we want to include um, assessing the whether the, the availability of um, is guidelines for PBT. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, guidelines on the PBTs. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think I think that would be uh, an important uh, point to to note, uh, and uh, we we would consider uh, you know assuming that we can get project funding going down to local government level because uh, a lot of uh, state uh, small infrastructure projects uh, go through the PBT, uh, and it would be a very good uh, citizen initiative for people to be able to track. Uh, the improvement projects at that level uh, and the, uh, whether those guidelines are available. Uh, thanks, Alisa. Yeah, I think, of course, uh, we, we really want to also track the, the level of transparency at the local level. Uh, and of course, if funding allow, and we will have this another assessment uh, next two years or another year, we will look for inputs and feedback from everyone here who attend the, the webinar and more than happy to to have a, a greater discussions on, on on the tool as well so i think we have about uh, 20 minutes before we end the the discussion there's a, a, a good question from isad here on the need for a digital team like the uk government uh, government digital service so because I think that our assessment uh, focus mostly on gov uh, documents available online. I think at this age, you know, of internet, it's, it's quite possible for all government to actually have these documents available online, but sometimes capacity and resources are not uh, available. So Isad here talks about the UK government digital service, which is a unit, I think, within the government that is tasked really to transform the, the, the provisions of online public services in the UK. Do you think something like that? I don't know, uh, maybe YB Imran, is it, is it something needed at the, at the state level? And, and if we are to embark in something like this, is it something possible uh, to do? So YB or maybe Trisha as well uh, from, from your uh, research on the state uh, policies, YB? Oh, sorry, the question is... Uh, the question is on, on, on the possibility of or, or whether we need to have a special section or special division within the government to actually to task to transform online public services. I know at the federal level we have Mampu, right? I think Mampu is tasked to actually uh, spearhead the digita digitation or digi digitalization or all these online public services, but at the state level, how would this uh, like body or, or insti uh, institution like Mampu operate and fund it? Um, okay. Um, in my opinion, uh, to make the government uh, uh, to make the government more transparent and to facilitate the government, uh, there must be uh, there must be a specific agencies or institutions. Uh, that provide such thing, uh, but the most important is uh, how the government uh, would like to implement it. Uh, uh, maybe I can comment to another question. Um, another, another, another good suggestion or proposal 
uh, is that the government, uh, instead of only presenting the yearly budget during the, the government speech, uh, during the budget uh, debate, uh, the government also must have maybe quarterly review or mid-year review uh, after the budget uh, announced or after the budget being uh, uh, table uh, during the state legislative assembly. So that um, the, the, the numbers of this, uh, the numbers of sitting days in the in the state legislative uh, assembly can be increased if quarterly we monitor and government table uh, their kpi or their their performance in terms of utilization or uh, or disposing uh, their budget that already approved in the previous years so this can be another initiatives uh, to be taken uh, into considerations uh, by the by the government. This is to promote uh, more accountability and transparency in term of in term of budgeting and uh, public money expenditure. Thank you, YB. I think uh, that's a really very important point to make. Uh, yeah, as Alisa mentioned earlier, our survey only track four budget documents. International best practice actually recommend governments to publish eight types of budget documents, including the one that YB just mentioned just now, media review, which will allow parliament, Adun, and also the public to, to see the implementations of the, the current budget uh, implementation, the current budget year implementation. Uh, Trisha, do you want to have comments on this, uh, on, on the need for a special uh, section within the state government to actually uh, yeah, deal on the online publications of documents and on transparency in general? Um, I mean, I'm quite hesitant to introduce like another platform because actually some state governments do have quite a, a lot already going on. So you've got like the, uh, the, the finance, the, the audit uh, website, you've got the day one website, you've got the executive website and so on, but I think um, I think it's helpful. I think if you're thinking about it more from a citizen's point of view, right? Like uh, if there is a one-stop place where all citizens can access documents, then definitely. I know that um, Selangor actually through its uh, smart Selangor uh, was trying to do that, was trying to do that. So they digitize everything. The, the, the parking is probably the, the one thing that I'm most happy about because I can just pay for it online. Uh, so I think there is some attempt at centralizing the digital communications uh, from the government. But I think actually the question from the, from the audience uh, by Issa is not about the executive. I think his question was on the legislative arm. So he was asking more about, can the state assembly itself be empowered to provide information? And this one, I would definitely agree with because there's a lot of information. Uh, there are select committees and um, PAC and all of that information coming from the day one itself that they should be releasing the information. So nothing to do with the executive, the day one itself. Uh, and of course, all this comes with the same things, right? Being able to have more resources dedicated to it, more staff, more empowerment, um, to, to have a dedicated uh, legislative website for data sharing, but uh, it goes back to the separation of powers as well, uh, which is what YB Imran was talking about earlier. So the separation of powers between the legislative and the executive arms of government, uh, we call for this at the federal government, the same thing applies at the state level. Um, the, legis the legislative arm should actually see itself as distinct and separate from the executive arm, which is not always the case, right? I think it's so difficult for them to see themselves as separate. Like they really should not answer to basically the Menteri Besar, uh, the answer to the speaker. So yeah, I mean, let's see if we can practice uh, more and more of this. Thank you, Trisha. We have 15 minutes before we end uh, the session, but actually, as, as I mentioned earlier, most of all of this result for, for both my OB and Pantau project will be published on the new website that IDEAS uh, has created. So I think my colleague Alisa and Arif will uh, go through the website uh, now. Alisa and Arif, uh, the time is yours.
All right, uh, I'm sharing. So we have uh, the pantawankita.com website and we are pleased to also launch it along with the uh, projects. And this is a platform for monitoring transparency in government budgets and expenditure in Malaysia. Uh, we started with uh, the state module. So you can see that uh, my OB and Pantau project are live here with all the states. Uh, and the states that have projects uh, assessed already. Uh, and uh, here's where uh, the federal portion will be under construction. Uh, so here's where uh, you can click in and uh, look into how the, into the assessment scores for every state. Uh, and if you uh, click, you can also look at the scorecards. So every state has a scorecard which would show its ranking. Uh, it's, uh, and the ranking is based on uh, the public availability or transparency score. And then uh, there's an oversight score as well. Uh, and then uh, scores uh, that the average here is taken on uh, specifically on the documents uh, that are assessed. So that's a breakdown. Uh, and then there's uh, further information on the oversight uh, score where there are different questions, including uh, the days that the assembly set in 2021. So uh, that's for the uh, state scorecards. And you can also view uh, the assessments and all the questions uh, if you would like. Yeah, so and that's uh, how our assessments were run. Okay, uh, on Pantau project, from here, uh, only the states that uh, had assessments are uh, active and uh, you can look into a state and choose since uh, someone asked about housing, this is the affordable housing uh, project that uh, was run, it's uh, expected to be completed end of this year. And the bar shows the number of points that uh, of information that were available on a uh, state government website, which was uh, available on third party website for yellow and for red, not available. Uh, and you can see all the data points uh, on, the, on the left and the information that was found uh, by our researchers on the right. And uh, yeah, so that is uh, how, our, how it works uh, for the website. Uh, feel free to browse and check it out later. All right. Thank you, Alisa. And I hope everyone has started going into the link that our team, our team has put in our chat box here. So do browse and visit the website and we are looking forward for comments, feedback and insight on, on this new website that we're launching. And we are hoping that this website will be a, a platform, not only for ideas, but also for our partners to share their views on, on budget. In the future, we plan to publish insights on the budget information on state level, as well as on federal uh, level, on the federal budget. So. We are looking forward to have a contribution from you as well, uh, so that this website will be the to-go website for budget monitoring. Uh, so yeah, please uh, watch this space because we will also put uh, information on the federal budget as well as on the Pantau Laksa, on the Laksana uh, implementation uh, for the stimulus packages. So I think we have about 10 minutes, but I think uh, we can wrap this event. I think what we, I want to thank, first of all, our partners, the researchers, and also the field reviewers. Uh, the researchers have done, have worked with us for the past eight months to produce this result. Uh, Alisa has put all the names and, uh, of our partners earlier. Uh, we want to thank you all of them for their commitment and time. Uh, and also we want to, Thank everyone here who attended our uh, event today. I hope you have insightful insights and new perspective on how uh, budget transparency uh, level in Malaysia and how I think most importantly on doing our part as citizen to improve accountability uh, of our government. Uh, I want to also thank you 
uh, thank uh, YB Imran and Trisha for joining the discussion today. And please, again, please visit the website, uh, this new website. And I think uh, we have another event actually coming up uh, next week on the on ASEAN, on youth in ASEAN. Do join us in this event. And thank you so much for, for joining us in discussion today and have a good have a good day. Thank you. Thank you, Uni. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.